Hello, everybody. I was born and raised in Hong Kong, so I am uh, homegrown, born here, went to school here, but I grew up in Hong Kong being the smallest kid. I think uh, when I was 10 years old, all the kids at that, at that age, everybody kind of grows at a different level, right? But they, everybody kind of grows this way. But for me, I kind of grew this way. I never really got any, got any taller than I am today. And as a result of that, I didn't really have a lot of self-esteem or self-confidence uh, in doing anything. And my parents were always very overprotective of me, like, oh, you're too small. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I believe that. And um, it, it kind of was a, was a big challenge for me when I, when I was going, uh, growing up here and, and going to school. And after all that time, I started doing different types of sports, and I, I found a lot of confidence in, in doing sports. And uh, I was doing, doing like track and field, cross country. Um, then I started doing more challenging sports like rock climbing, uh, scuba diving, jumping out of airplanes, just doing all kinds of different challenges. And when I look back on, on all the different things, I finally found something that was incredibly challenging, which is this picture here. And this is the Sahara D Desert in Egypt. And if you can imagine the Sahara Desert in Egypt, it's 50 degrees Celsius during the day, 37 degrees at night, and I'm running 250 kilometers. So that is six consecutive marathons carrying a backpack with all your food and equipment in it. And it doesn't matter if, if it's hot or if the sun's beating down on you and, and you're dehydrated and you're thirsty. Um, all the different challenges like sandstorms, all those different types of things, yet it's six consecutive marathons back to back and having to complete that with, with a backpack. And I've actually done quite a few of these. I've completed five continents, so I, I've done uh, 250 kilometers across all of those different countries. And I really want to do one, uh, a couple in, um, in North America and also in Europe. And if I still have my running legs, I'd love to do um, Russia and India. So there's a fundamental difference between astronomers and astronauts, but you have to ask yourself, which one are you? Do you want to live through the stories that other people tell you, or do you want to experience them yourself? The Amazon jungle, Brazil. Uh, this is an amazing place. Uh, if you think about running across the desert, there's really not a lot of obstacles, right? It's just sand, sand, sand everywhere. Well, in, in the jungle, of course, you've got trees and all kinds of brush, and, and not to mention that, but it's also, also wet, it's very humid, and every single creepy crawl you can imagine is out there, right? Everything from, from the small little ants to the spiders to the snakes to, to the jaguars, there's all of these different types of scary things that are out there, and it's also six consecutive marathons or 250 kilometers while carrying a backpack and having to go through all of that. So you're running through the jungle, and then you're getting in the river, and you're swimming across the river, then you're back in the jungle again, and you're running, and the whole time you're, you're completely wet, and uh, your feet kind of look like that, and you have to run at night, which is also pretty scary, and of course there's all these different bugs that you can, bug bites you can get, and all of this equipment here, I had to carry in a backpack with me, and it's, it's your food, uh, your, uh, your first aid equipment, uh, your clothes, just all the different types of things that you need to carry you for, for the next seven days. And the next picture here shows me uh, crossing the river. And um, I think they, they didn't allow us to swim across the river because there were piranhas or crocodiles or something in the water that they didn't want us to be exposed to. So we had to um, uh, basically go across this rope. And if you can see this, this thing here, these were um, these, these plastic kind of panels uh, that you can buy. Um, and these are to protect me against snake bites because I'm really scared of snakes, and I didn't want to be going through the jungle where you've got all this brush around you, and you can't really see the snakes because they're camouflaged, and you're running along, and you don't really want to be stepping on them or, or, or risk getting bitten by them. So I started doing all this research on the internet, and I found that, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to buy these things, which protect you against snake bites, and I'm going to go run with these. So I show up uh, um, on this run, and all the other fellow runners kind of looked at me, and they're like, what are you wearing these things for? Are you going to go play soccer? Are you going to go play football? 
And I'm like, no, these are actually uh, to protect me against snake bites. And it was really funny because there was a silence among the crowd. And they're all thinking like, ah, smart guy, right? So, and, and we're running along and um, every time we got to a section where there was like too much brush and you couldn't see the ground, they would stop. And they were like, oh, let that guy from Hong Kong go by first. And I'd, I'd kind of lead the way. And it's really funny because the, um, uh, a, a lot of the runners, everybody kind of speaks different languages. And no one remembers my name, right? This, the guy from Hong Kong. So they called me uh, Jackie Chan. They're like, oh, let Jackie Chan go by first. <clears throat> so uncomfortable doesn't kill you. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the important lesson. And a lot of people ask me, well, what about training? How do you train in Hong Kong? You live in this, this urban environment, this concrete jungle. Uh, how do you go about training for these types of things? And, and the thing about ultra marathons or running 250 kilometers, there's no real training method. I mean, who wants to run that anyway, right? So there's, there's, there's no real standard of, of training. Like, you can't go to the gym and do some weights and go run on the treadmill for a little while and then, and then be expected to be able to go run across a desert or, or run across a jungle. So you have to think outside the box. You have to get creative. You don't uh, just work with the tools that you have. You kind of have to expand your thinking and, and really try to think about what it is that you're doing. So I run with rice, 16 kilograms of rice. And my friends, um, they call that uh, mini me. And, um, I run across the beaches, on the roads, uh, down by Times Square. Uh, after work, I run, I run at the gym. And there's a funny story here is I'm running at the gym, I'm on the treadmill. I've got mini me on my back and I'm running. And uh, one of the uh, gym attendants comes over and he goes, oh, excuse me, you must be new here. Uh, I just want to let you know that we have locker rooms. You can put all your backpack there, you don't have to carry it with you. <clears throat> And I really believe that a lot like the military is, is when, you're, when you're training, you should, you should train like, like you're actually going to be in the event or you should, you should train like uh, on, the, on, the, on the day that you're actually there and experience uh, or try to mimic the experience that you would be feeling. So what I, what I mean by run sleepy, it means like going out to Long Kwai Fong on a Friday night and then coming home really late at 3 or 4 in the morning and then having to get up a couple hours later on Saturday morning to go running. You know, you don't, you're not going to have that full night's sleep. You're not going to have that uh, big dinner or be well rested when you're running 250 kilometers. Every day, you're going to get progressively more and more tired. So run hungry, run thirsty, run hot, run cold. When your legs are tired, the next day, go out and run again. Get your body used to the stress. And if you feel like you've got a cold, go out and run again. You, you, you can't, you know, you, you can't be 100% ready for anything. So don't fail. If you fail in training, you'll fail in the real world. Training takes dedication. And what I want you to see here is, is what, what, what they've told you is that you know, there's, there's seven jungles, uh, seven deserts, two jungles, and one alpine event. But what I wanted to focus on was, was what you don't see what it took to get there. So I've run 7,000 kilometers, which is about the width of China is 5,200 kilometers, so I've run a distance greater than that. I burned through 50 pairs of shoes. I've worn out six heart rate monitors. I've ruined far too many MP3 players that I can, that I can keep count of. I've consumed a swimming pool of, of sports drinks. And people really laugh at me when I run with a backpack. It's like one time I ran from, from, from Times Square all the way out to South Bay and back with, with Mini-Me. And you know, there's this taxi line there, right? There's all these taxi drivers that are parked out there. And one taxi driver rolled down the window and goes, hey, didn't I see you out in South Bay? And I said, yeah. And he goes, you didn't run all the way back here, did you? And I said, yes. He said, I could have driven you there. <laughs> and I had three girls, three girlfriends broke up with me. But the benefit is I can eat unlimited junk food because I can. <laughs> so what's your biggest intention? Well, let me rephrase that. What is your biggest goal, right? Let's pick some, uh, a common example that everybody understands. Losing weight, right? Everybody wants to lose weight, guys and girls. So initially, it feels great, right? You've made a statement, I'm going to lose weight. You tell all your friends, you tell your, fam tell your family, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to look like that guy, right? And then 
you, what you've done is you've set expectations, right? Escalation of expectations. Now everybody's watching, everybody's listening. They want to see, can you actually carry through what you've said you've done? So the reality hits, and then you go out there, and let's say you buy that treadmill. You're all gung-ho about it, and you start running on that, and you're, you, you're on your pathway to achieving that goal. And then you think about it, it's like, oh no, I just created more work for myself. And that's what it ends up looking like. So you need to change the identity of the goal. Use a language that you understand. That's really important. Uh, if we use an example, is a marathon 42 kilometers or is it four times uh, 10 kilometers on Bowen Road? Or how about from, for you, if you don't run, maybe it's 7,000 trips to McDonald's. It doesn't matter what it, what, what, what it is. You just have to put it in a language that you understand. How about push-ups? Is it 500 or is it 50 times 100? But running 250 kilometers, that's 250K. I don't care how you try to uh, think about it, it's a significant distance. So you switch it up. You think about it from checkpoint to checkpoint or campsite to campsite. <clears throat> Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Um, I tore my Achilles tendon. I completely snapped. My, um, my uh, calf muscle was up behind my knee and everybody said, that's a career ender. You're, you're not going to be able to, uh, to, to do much anymore. And a lot of people think, oh, how did you do that? Did you run across the desert? No, I did that playing dodgeball. So five months later, I went through all of this recovery. I had uh, the surgery. I had the cast. I had the special boot. And I thought to myself, you know what? Times have changed. Don't wait for things to return to normal. This is the new normal. And against what everybody thought, five weekends later, I went and ran the Macau Marathon. Eight weeks later, I ran the Hong Kong Marathon. And then uh, 13 weeks later, I went to Namibia, and I ran 250 kilometers. And my doctor was so happy, he put me in, in the hospital brochure. <clears throat> so the last thing I just want to end with is don't wait. The time will never be just right. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that we live in a world of disruption. We, we live in a world of distraction, meaning that there's so many things that distract us, and we have uh, these, these things with technology that help to harness all of that, right? You've got your mobile phone, you've got your, your iPhone, your Blackberry, you've got SMS, you've got WhatsApp, you've got email, you've got MSN, you, you've got all these different types of things, um, and those are the distractions, but you have to keep focused on the goal of whatever you set out to do, okay? So I really want to leave you with that final message is don't wait. The time will never be just right. Thank you.